Welcome. I'm Steve Parrish. I'm the co-director of the American College Center for Retirement Income. And today's topic, as I hope you know, is current annuity considerations in retirement planning. We have three great experts to talk about this. Wade Pfau, who is a name familiar to many of you and who is my co-director at the Center for Retirement Income. Michelle Richter and Tommy Co. Toland. Usually I'm in the thick of things in these webinars, but today I'm going to kick things off and then since Wade Pau is such a national expert on annuities, he's going to take over with a conversation with our experts. But I first want to give you some perspective, and it's my perspective. I'm going to personalize it because I have five annuities. And I think this debate over annuities, yes, or annuities, no, is kind of a wrong-headed perspective. Almost all of us will have an annuity in our retirement plan. Whether we want it or not, it's called Social Security, and that's an annuity. The question is whether annuities fit and how do they fit into a financial plan. So in my case, I have two provided annuities, if you will. I am on Social Security, and I receive a defined benefit from my former employer. Now, my other three annuities are what we'll call voluntary annuities, and I'm just giving them as an example so you can think about how they might be used in retirement planning, which is today's topic. First, years ago, I funded a non-deductible IRA with a variable annuity. My plan at the time, which has since been accomplished, is that I'd use that non-deductible IRA as a backdoor Roth IRA. Second, I paid premiums into a high cash value whole life plan for 25 years, a long time. So when my wife and I uh, came into our 60s, we decided that we no longer needed that particular life insurance policy. What we did is we 1035 exchanged it, that's a tax-free exchange, to a single premium immediate annuity that pays for our lifetime. And then the third voluntary annuity, um, and my most recent annuity, is a QLAC. In December, my feeling was that the stock market was hot and it was time to take some money off uh, or take some of the gain off of the table. So I used a portion of my IRA money to purchase a QLAC that's going to provide me and my wife with a lifetime income when I reach the age of 75. Now, you may disagree with me, but I think these strategies have and are serving me well. My wife and I have a substantial floor income, uh, what I call a DIY DB plan, in other words, a do-it-yourself defined benefit plan. We have tax deferral, and we have a comparatively less demanding requirement for required minimum distributions, RMDs, when I turn age 72. And there's another consideration. By taking some of my retirement capital off the table, I think it actually allows me to feel more comfortable with having the rest in market. I can be more aggressive in my investing because of the floor income I've provided through these five annuities. That's my story, but it's not unique. Annuity sales are up 12% higher in 2021 than 2020. And according to the IRI, sales of fixed and variable annuities total $233 billion in 2021, their highest level since 2008. But uh, why do some people remain hesitant to buy annuities? We'll have some conversation about it, but I'm just going to throw out uh, the reasons in my mind is a lot of people don't understand annuities. It's kind of like life insurance. It's become very complicated. Second, consumers are worried about losing their bet if they die young. Third, they're worried about investing annuities in an inflationary environment. And I want to make sure that we address that today. And fourth is just the market noise, the you know fussing over costs and commissions and all that kind of thing. So my point is, I'm excited to hear from the annuity experts about current annuity considerations in retirement planning. Wade, Michelle, Tomiko, enlighten us. Hey, great. Yeah, thank you, Steve. Uh, let me begin the session today by thanking both Tamiko and Michelle for joining us and to introduce them for our audience. So first, Tamiko Tolan is the Director for Retirement Markets for the Toronto-based firm Canix. And her focus there is on individual and institutional annuity markets in the United States and Canada. So Canix has long been known as a leading provider of income annuity pricing and now serves the entire scope of annuity products with information on, available on evaluating annuities with income guarantees as well. She's responsible for the research on annuities and strategy, as well as thought leadership in the annuity space. 
She has more than 15 years of experience tracking trends and key issues on retirement income. And in the interest of supporting the development of the industry, Tomiko also serves on the board for the National Association of, for Fixed Annuities, as, as well as she's an advisor member of the Institutional Retirement Income Council. Next, our second guest today, Michelle Richter, is the founder and principal for Fiduciary Insurance Services, which is a firm founded on the belief that the future of holistic financial advice in the United States should consider risk gold products offered by insurance companies within institutionally sponsored wealth management paradigms. She's also the executive director at the Institutional Retirement Income Council. She's a passionate business leader with more than 15 years of experience designing, deploying, and scaling innovative insurance and wealth management products and programs. She has expertise in integrating wealth management, life insurance, annuities, and asset management for both retail and institutional businesses. She's also a named inventor on a patented method for insurance and investment product decision modeling. Her emphasis is on operations leadership, human capital development, quantitative modeling expertise, collaboration with sales and distribution, and compliance and regulatory oversight, as well as product and program development. So again, thank you both for joining us on today's session. And as we get started here, there's so much we can talk about in terms of current annuity considerations. There's been new legislation and there's new legislation that may be coming down the pipeline. We see a changing regulatory environment and we see a greater push right now with qualified retirement plans, looking at including more lifetime income options. It's really hard to know where to start, especially as both of you have been front and center with a lot of these recent developments. But Michelle, I think a good place to start is a question for you. And I don't mean for this to be a grammar lesson, but you've become quite known recently, especially this Tuesday even in wealth management, you wrote an article about verbs and nouns. And I think that can help to guide a lot of our discussion today. Uh, what do you mean by this distinction between verbs and nouns when it comes to financial services the regulatory environment and, and how we think about annuities. Great question, Wade, and, and thank you so much to you and to the American College for having me here today. It's an honor to get to talk about these things. Um, you know, my view, uh, having, having previously served in the capacity of a regulatory principal for a broker dealer and registered investment advisor at a Fortune 100 company is that registered investment advisors sell verbs and that agents and brokers sell nouns, which are products. And so, um, and in particular, uh, the Investment Advisors Act of 1940 um, covers investments which occur on the left-hand side of the balance sheet. Whereas income is an income statement premise and insurance is the liability management industry, which is the right side of the balance sheet. So the important distinction, in my view, between verbs and nouns relates to how a person who focuses on liability management can market themselves since the 1940 Act covers the left side of the balance sheet and verb sales therein, where annuities and our industry more broadly covers the right side of the balance sheet. So there isn't a regulatory construct for how people who want to act as fiduciaries or who want to act in the best interests of their clients um, can do so when their point of view is about income or and or about liabilities. Okay, thank you. And uh, following up on this issue, so Tamiko, with some of the research you've done, if we're trying to frame annuities more in the verb context of like, how can an annuity contribute to a financial plan I think you've done a lot of research in that area. And what have you learned about the outcomes related to annuities that if we're comparing different financial strategies for a retirement plan, uh, what is it exactly that annuities are able to potentially contribute to those types of planning outcomes? Is, is it something that a fiduciary who's trying to serve the best interests of their client can model in, in a light that shows a positive contribution there? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I published a piece earlier this year. Yeah, it was <laughs> earlier this year. Um, and it was basically about the use of the annuity, the guaranteed income stream from 
whatever kind of annuity as a fixed income replacement within the retirement portfolio. And that this, um, generally speaking, Im improves outcomes as far as um, retirement sustainability, but it also improves legacy. And this effect we actually saw most uh, when you were replacing some of the fixed income allocation with annuity for um, like a higher equity allocation portfolio. So that's really looking at it much more purely from, you know, the uh, investment perspective. Um, but, you know, obviously I think that there, there's also the insurance component to it. And one of my positions, and this is based upon some um, research on consumer attitudes, is that um, investors are a lot happier with their financial professional uh, when they own annuities as part of a plan. And so we, we really strongly believe that you know, this, an annuity is not a product as much as it is part of a plan because that is actually when people are happiest with, with them and that makes them a lot happier with the services that they're provided by their financial professional. Mm -hmm. Uh, great. And so I think there's a slide we can share as we move into this next question from Michelle. Tomiko talks about how you can see these positive outcomes, improved success rates, improved legacy values for this type of integrated strategy. And so if there's a role for the, this conversation to be treated more as the, the verb of how can an annuity contribute to a retirement plan, do you foresee a greater evolution towards having advice about annuities being available as a service rather than as just purely as a product sale? And who would be best positioned to provide such advice? And also, I mean, how does that relate to what we see here on, on the, this image with the <laughs> defined benefit pension? I guess the short answer to your question, Wade, is I sure hope so, because I'm putting a ton of human capital behind this premise that this is of concern. Um, my, my view is that people who can position themselves as providing those holistic services to their end clients are those people who will win in this context. Um, and that can be financial planning. Um, and I am a big proponent of financial planning. Um, and But it can evolve in a number of ways. It isn't about which compensation mechanism is the mechanism that the financial professional uses. It truly is about the ability to frame their services and those people who can provide that kind of holistic approach to their clients are the people in my view who will win. Um, and, and, I, and I sure hope so again, because you know, what I see when I look at a slide like this is, is deep concern because you know, when the defined benefit pension uh, space switched to a defined contribution space, um, it's no longer the case that the liabilities associated with the provision of retirement income are recorded on any balance sheets anywhere, because most consumers may they may know what assets they have, and even that's a question as to whether or not they know that, but they most certainly don't understand their retirement income liabilities. Historically, when DB existed, um, and this, this chart is put together by data, data that comes from Boston College's Center for Retirement Research, and it communicates the proportion of households that used to have defined benefit pension plans relative to the proportion that has them now. And, um, and it's not the case that the same people who used to have DB now have DC. Rather, it is the case that when we review this data, we observe that I, I look specifically at my father's birth year, which is 1945, and I observe that greater than 50% of the population had a DB pension. And the reason for the need for annuities now is that those same people do not have a source of retirement income that's guaranteed to them. And because consumers don't protect their own liabilities, it's not necessarily the case that they know that they need to cover this amount of income for themselves. 
So, um, so I see this and I think, my goodness, like what is going to happen to the generation of retirees that are, you know, if so, so I look, you know, I said my father's birth year in 1945, my mother was born in 1952. Um, the population in her birth year, you can see on this chart, it just north of 25% of the population had a DB pension then. And by the time you get to my birth year in 1979, you're, you're down into the single digit proportion. So I worry that not all Americans realize what has occurred. And that's the reason why we're all here. Yeah, absolutely. I, I know Mark Erie, who was at the Treasury Department for years, he talks about how when we shifted from defined benefit to defined contribution with 401ks, it's really undefined contribution because it all became voluntary and people had to make these decisions within the context of assets and they don't know how to translate those assets into liabilities. So thank you. And Tamika, you mentioned that people feel more satisfied, uh, the research you found that when they have an annuity in place that it helps them feel more comfortable with retirement planning. Another facet of uh, a research you've conducted, and Steve, we do also have an image for this one as well. Uh, you, you look at consumer attitudes towards annuities versus financial advisor attitudes towards what consumers <laughs> believe about annuities. There is a, a common notion out there that an annuity is something that's sold rather than bought. And that, you know, at the end of the day, this kind of this idea that from the advisory world that consumers are not interested in annuities, but based on the research you've done, do you find that to be the right point of view or is there an, a problem with that sort of mindset? I want to start by saying that, you know, this, the idea that annuities are sold and not bought, I mean, it's, there's a reason for that. Annuities need to be really be planned. And so, you know, really most people who want this kind of coverage, yet fine, there may be some DIY folks, really most of them need help and they want an annuity to be part of a plan. The fact of the matter is that um, financial professionals really underestimate the interest of their clients. Um, in annuities. And in this case, you, you know, you see it's sort of about a little over 80% think that um, of both financial professionals and investors see them as being extremely or somewhat um, appealing. But the thing is that um, the interest among investors is actually quite a bit more intense than financial professionals assume. Um, and this is a a situation that has been going on for a long time. I mean, we, we've been doing various versions of this questionnaire for a number of years, and we've really found very similar results. So I think that what we know is that investors really like what annuities do. And I think one of the problems is that there is no such thing as a single annuity. There are so many different kinds of annuities, and there are many different applications. And so being able to distill that down and properly deploy that within a plan, that is really the job of the financial professional. And I think that investors are maybe much more receptive to that kind of strategy than professionals imagine will be the case. Okay. Now, now shifting gears a little bit towards uh, more on the defined benefit world, or not, more on the qualified retirement plan world, as well as some of the legislation and so forth. Uh, Michelle and Tamika, both of you have been instrumental in creating a new lifetime income consortium that works with defined contribution plans. Uh, so first, Michelle, like, what motivated that? And what is that organization seeking to accomplish? Well, I think you know, the, the slide that we just saw, both actually both of the slides that we just saw inform the point of view as to why concern is there, right? Um, you know, with respect to the translation of, um, you know, assets into the meeting of liabilities, right? So historically, the defined contribution space, well, historically, Americans used to have defined benefit pension plans, and they don't anymore. So that's a big motivator for us to, or at least for me, to want to uh, address that. Um, but, but it also is the case that the historical framework for defined contribution has been 
and asset management oriented one in particular around fees um, you know, and, and that's the basis of most litigation that we see in the defined contribution space. So when, when, when uh, regulations have evolved recently, including importantly, the SECURE Act, um, that, that communicated the government's perspective that lifetime income within plan could be quite useful. Um, and that it should not be the case that solutions that include lifetime income should be compared at a cost basis to those that don't include it, or that that should be the basis by which an advisor determines the appropriate solution for a given plan, that it's not the case that the advisor should choose the least expensive annuity product for that plan, rather, the guidance says that the advisor should choose the uh, solutions that provide the best cost benefit trade off for the given plan. Well, given that the that space has been so dominated by an asset management oriented perspective, defined contribution, right, that's the amount you're putting in, um, that um, it was necessary when the legislation changed for the industry to come together to articulate what, what would be the right framework for this new way of evaluation. So, so for me, and, and I, I wouldn't want to speak for time ago, but, but you know, we, we had been in conversation for a few years about our concerns about helping to bridge this gap. And, um, and, uh, and so we communicated with um, John Faustino at FI360 and the three of us together have you know, each taken our own perspective into this, um, and we have catalyzed the creation of a group of organizations that feel similarly that it would be helpful to provide two things. Um, you know, one is the ability to educate the plan advisory space on the utility of income constructs and even what they are since, since that community has been, like I said, so focused and necessarily so on the asset management side of things. And then secondarily, it, so, so from that perspective, it's just education. And, and we have a series of monthly webinars that time ago will be coordinating and leading um, to, to educate that community. And we've also, um, and this again is through the work of Canex, that um, we're creating the ability to have independently validated metrics on various elements of how income can um, be helpful quantitatively um, to the experience of the plan and to the to its participants. And so that's an enormous amount of work that's occurring on the part of Canex and the manufacturers who are working with, with them to um, gather that information. And so the end result is intended to be and will be um, a fiduciary process by which to evaluate in-plan income that is what's needed and we feel i feel strongly that um that we're on that path to creating that not later than the end of this year for our first draft of how retirement plan advisors can use this information right away wonderful now related to this point as well there was the secure act in 2019 that maybe is most famous for ending the lifetime stretch on the inherited ira for um, many types of beneficiaries, but Tameko, it, it also, it made it easier to incorporate annuities into qualified retirement plans. Thus far, there hasn't really seemed to have been a whole lot of move in that direction. We've seen some here and there, like different companies are starting to move into that space, but do you foresee that trend as being something that's about to change and that we're going to see a, a quicker or broader adoption of annuities into the qualified retirement plan space? So I guess quicker is relative. Um, I, <laughs> this is still a very slow boil situation um, because it, you know, people often compare this to target date funds and the, the real rapid adoption of target date funds once they were became QDIA. Um, but that we're talking about investment solution compared to other investment solutions. And the income solution is fundamentally different. There are a lot of components of that that are different for a lot of the different stakeholders. And just touching on the, the secure 1.0 um, issue, you know, I, I know there was a 
just a lot of conversation around this and a lot of activity and interest from sponsors in these solutions after secure um, came into effect. But I don't think it was purely like secure doesn't really sort of like fix everything. Um, you know, we've seen a series of incremental updates to facilitate implementation of lifetime income solutions within 401k plans and specifically as QDIA. But this secure allows there are creates like very clear guidelines around the selection of the insurer, but not around the, the actual solution. And uh, to Michelle's point, this is really the core of the work that we're doing through the consortium is to facilitate the education, um, the understanding of this different dimension of income and how it's fundamentally different because you can't simply take your, even if you are familiar with retail annuities, you can't simply take that understanding and drop it into the QDIA format and think that that is like a sufficient way of looking at it because you're talking about a very different circumstance where it's for many people. And so you're not able to sort of economically optimize and that we're accustomed to that optimization uh, perspective on, in the retail space. So, you know, really the reason that I care so deeply about this, this area of development, despite this, my anticipated slowness in the, in the uh, adoption at this point, but I think it's incredibly important because um, the employer sponsored plan is the place where the participants who are the least engaged, those who have the least amount of assets, who have the least amount of access to guidance outside of their 401k plan are going to get access to lifetime income that they really need. So I think that, you know, when I look at it, I, I really think about the folks that are least advantaged and have access to 401ks are the ones who benefit the most by having that accessible. Great, great. And Michelle, I'd really like to ask you the same basic question as well in terms of what you foresee about like any sort of inflection point here where I think it's, I've heard you say it's about 9% of qualified retirement plans now offer some type of lifetime income solution as part of the plan. Are we going to see that number change? <laughs> and if so, when? <laughs> yes, um, but but exactly to Tomiko's point, it's not like you you turn it on and boom, it's there. Um, you know, the whole industry moves. I think there is there is a lot of work to be done to establish the mechanisms that make it possible. Uh, for example, the insurance industry is historically. Um, operates pretty separately from the record keeping communities. And so there's, you know, technological work that's occurring now that enables these values to be reported within record keeping systems. So that's just one example of the fundamental, the point that Tomika was making about a fundamental mind shift that's occurring as we speak. Um, to enable these kinds of solutions to exist. So, so my view, um, and, and is, is kind of follows from Tomiko's point around, um, you know, widespread adoption in DC plans then ultimately makes it possible for, um, for example, when legislation uh, makes it so that um, less uh, advantaged Americans have access to individual retirement plans, either through states or otherwise, if the um, framework is set up that enables these solutions to occur in the broader DC space, then they will roll down to the rest of America in time. My view is that it's probably a few years off before we see material movement, but we can look at really big plans and what they're doing which oftentimes now for the recruitment of people during the great resignation is requiring the ability to provide income through plan. You're right, Wade, that historically there has not been an emphasis on income derived from plan, but it's coming to be the case that the government views this in a positive way and that advisors are starting to view the possibility that this could occur and we're all working together to try to make it so that an inflection point does occur. I think it's a few years off, but I'm hopeful for it. Okay, and some of the other issues that may impact that inflection point are, are new legislation, new regulations. So let's talk a bit about that. And Tamiko, you called the SECURE Act SECURE 1.0, and that's because 
currently working its way through Congress, it's now passed in the House and it's being taken up by the Senate is the SECURE Act 2.0. Uh, can you talk about any interesting developments there related to annuities and at least with the house version if that were to come to fruition what that might how that what kind of impact that would have on the sure annuity? yeah I, you know i think um there's not a ton in there directly related to annuities and particularly you know for plans but you know one component that that comes up it's a favorite topic of many is a qualified longevity annuity contract and so that's um, the QLAC. It's the it's a deferred income annuity that is designed specifically to work well with RMD rules. And I have to say that um, you know we've at Canex we we do, do actually collect statistics on quoting, and you know obviously with uh, with the initiation of QLAC we started looking at this, and we saw a lot more of these quotes coming through. Um, but there. They it was really a wealth management play, um, but there is actually an effort to use QLAX in association with 401k plans as a, as a, as a feature of the plan, um, as an optional chosen benefit of, of individuals who, rec who like Steve, <laughs> recognize the benefit. I, sorry, I forgot you already did, you already did the, the acronym for us, so, but but uh, there are people who recognize the benefit of that. Um, and you know, I, this is not what I would call the central lane of solution development in this space, um, because currently you cannot use a key like even with change the changes under Secure 2.0, which would you know double the amount that you could potentially put in the key like and, and what have you. Um, it doesn't make it eligible for use inside the QDIA. Um, right now, we see it sort of as like a more of a sidecar uh, where you divert some assets outside into it. Um, but it's another solution, um, and it's sort of leveraging some of the benefits of annuity design. Yeah, yeah Michael Finca at the American College loves talking about QLEX, so it's great to <laughs> have that brought up today. And and yeah, facilitating easier use of that as a well as a lifetime income option, but also well, partly if they increase the RMD age, it reduces some of the benefit on the tax side for the QLAC, exactly. but it also makes it easier to put more funds into the QLAC at the same time. Uh, now, Michelle, another area where we're seeing innovation with the regulation is uh, this whole world of Department of Labor rollovers uh, from 401k plans to IRAs and so forth. And there's a couple of rules in there. There's the PTE 202002 and the PTE 2484 that are both being revised. Uh, could you talk about the distinction between those rules, what they may look like in the future? And as well, if we see that there is this fiduciary requirement as part of them, are financial institutions that are otherwise not really uh, needing to worry about this today, are they gonna be able to make that sort of transition whenever there is a product recommendation related to a rollover justification? to serve in that fiduciary capacity with these updated regulations? <laughs> so the answer to that is yes, too. Um, and in, in, so, so at a high level, um, the as it stands currently, um, effective February 1st, uh, the first element of prohibited transaction exemption 2020-02 went into effect, which, um, you know, requires the fiduciary representation from among those who do recommend rollovers. It has historically been the case that the um, the, the point of view was taken that the ERISA five-part test, which includes a perspective on the need to provide ongoing guidance, um, historically the view was that if the financial professional was enacting a one-time transaction, that um, that that wouldn't be the case that the that the end client would perceive that person as needing to act in the role of a fiduciary or needing to provide ongoing advice. Um, and and labor's really clarified that viewpoint um, in saying as they have um, in the preamble to this guidance that um, that their view is that even those one-time transactions, should be viewed through the lens of the person needs to act in the capacity of fiduciary um, if they're going to qualify for PTE 2002, which enables them to receive that conflicted, comp what labor views as conflicted compensation. 
Um, and that's a distinct prohibited transaction exemption that allows for the financial professional to receive compensation than is PTE 8424, which has not been updated since 1984, as it's named, and which we should expect to see updated this year. Now, historically, because of that uh, ongoing uh, interaction uh, perspective up through February, the industry hasn't really needed to rely on 8424 very much. But as it stands right now, for those financial for those insurance professionals who um, act in an independent capacity, selling fixed products only, they don't have a regulatory overseer who could help them to qualify for PTE 2020-02. So those individuals who, um, who are independent and who may work with the support of an independent marketing organization to help them place contracts, those financial professionals um, cannot use PT 202 to receive compensation. They can use PT 8424. And as it stands, the majority of the insurance industry is requiring that attestation from the financial professional that they are meeting these requirements of 8424 when they affect a qualified policy sale. We should expect the guidance, and, and this does not require uh, the fiduciary representation through 8424 as it stands currently. But it's not clear whether or not that could change as the as they are reviewing this guidance right now. So, um, so it's not perfectly clear whether there will come to be organizations that will choose to serve in the capacity of financial institution for those independent producers who do who are in that situation right now. Um, but but clearly, labor had a perspective that it they prefer for assets to remain in plan except to the extent that the financial professional can uh, communicate what the reason is and in, in July that's the the um, material part of what gets updated around 2020-02 is that the financial professional will need to document a specific reason for the rollover recommendation to be made and um, and so plan doesn't have annuity has historically been uh, checked off as the reason for many financial professionals that do do rollovers. And now coming in July when these specific um, uh, clarifications need to be made to the consumer, it will be the case that enforcement will occur if it uh, is not the, the case that when that the reason that the financial professional provided for why the rollover was occurring is not the reason that the, is not included in the recommendation that they ultimately make. So there's a lot of there's a lot of moving parts around this, and there is a lot of work that has gone on behind the scenes amongst the financial institution community to enable that to occur for financial professionals. We'll kind of see as the year moves on how that evolves, but so far it seems to be working. And Tamiko, could you comment on whether there's going to be any spillover effects of this onto plan sponsors who, I mean, perhaps maybe there was more of a thought that, you know, individuals will roll over to an IRA. And so we don't necessarily have to think about the post-retirement options within the plan. Is that going to be something that's impacted by if there is this increasing move toward perhaps it being more likely that plans are kept, our assets are kept in plan, that plan sponsors may be pushed to make some changes from their side as well? I think that plan sponsor motivation for this is independent of this issue. Um, but I certainly see um, the lifetime income disclosure rule, which is now putting like an, you know, an annuitization amount onto the statements once a year. Um, that is something that will educate um, participants about the availability or the possibility of getting, you know, re recurring income, right? And I, I thought that if anything, because most plans don't have any kind of annuity available, that that is all the more reason for the retail side of the business to expect to, you know, get greater interest from plan participants who want that kind of solution. So it's a little bit of an education campaign, I think, for participants. I, it's a little bit controversial, to be honest with you, but, um, I, you know, it's, but it's like I say, it's a bit of a push me pull you because now we have this, uh, I would say, regulatory resistance or compliance 
compliance complications <laughs> for the rollovers um, that you know might make some folks resistant to engage in that kind of business and where it becomes all that more important to be offering options within the plans. The unfortunate thing is I think that people need access to good retirement income solutions, whether those are guaranteed or not. And um, right now, the really the best pathway is, you know, in, in the retail space through the services of a financial professional. Um, I obviously have a lot of hope for, um, you know, the employer sponsored plans to, you know, kind of kick it up a notch, but there's a lot of challenges there too. So I, I, I still see the more pluses currently on the side for folks who are helping individual investors create a customized and optimized plan. Mm -hmm. So uh, another question, and this came up a little bit in the earlier discussion, but I would like to ask it to both of you. When we talk about like the ideal financial professional or what kind of services the ideal financial professional would provide, in the RICP curriculum, we do explain different retirement strategies, investments only, total return investing, time segmentation, flooring approaches. Uh, I think I know the answer you'll give, but is what what's the best approach for an advisor? Should they really focus on one particular strategy and apply that to their clients and whether they try to apply it to everyone or try to identify those for whom it may be most appropriate? Or should they really be thinking more holistically in terms of let's provide different tools and solutions, whether it's investments, whether it's bond ladders, whether it's annuities, and then be able to customize solutions from a broader range of tools rather than narrowly focusing on one particular aspect of financial services. Michelle, we could start that with you. Okay. Um, my view is that the right answer is the answer to which the person is scored through the use of a new framework called the Retirement Income Style Awareness Framework that was invented by Wade Vow and Alex Murgia. Um, importantly, that I'm, so I'm being a little cheeky, but in all seriousness, um, you know, my view is that um, each individual person has a different perspective on what it is that they want from retirement. And it's really important for the financial professional to assess that, whether it's through that particular framework or it's through another one. The answer is not the noun. It's not the end product. It's the process by which the advisor assists the person that they're working with in um, becoming aware of what their preferences are, because my view is that retirement income optimization does not occur in the domain of finance. It does occur in the domain of psychology, or rather at the intersection between the two. And because this is my view, I feel that advisors are and clients are best served by trying to find out where the person stands with respect to their preferences and then helping to make recommendations to that person that fit with what their preferences are. Okay, and Tommy Coda, maybe add a little twist for you with that question as well. Uh, for financial professionals who traditionally haven't necessarily worked with the nouns of, of annuities, uh, what can they do to potentially have more opportunity if assuming you share the same answer as Michelle, that you know you have to think more holistically here, how can advisors who traditionally haven't had that sort of ability to offer these different types of solutions to be able to incorporate that into their practices? Sure. Um, so I actually want to start by referring back to uh, the PRIP study that we did last year in which we asked um, financial professionals about their planning styles for retirement income for their clients. We asked the clients as well. They're they're not as clear, I think, about what was going on. But what was interesting is that when we define different, um, and this actually before we were aware of the RISA framework, um, we asked questions that basically placed people into the different quadrants of RISA. And we found that most financial professionals have one style that they use. And we know that in reality, people are spread out in terms of their distribution of what their preferences are. So what that means, if you only deploy a single style, then you are not meeting the preference of a large number of your clients, unless you by happenstance end up only with clients 
that want the style that you're providing. So, you know, I think for folks who are, you know, really looking at it from more of a portfolio management standpoint, which works great for a good chunk of folks, right? That, um, you know, really like the the uh, Wade's uh, safety first perspective, like the income flooring, it's very easy to deploy. I mean, you can certainly put your own twists on various things with, you know, as far as laddering and what have you. But, um, you know, I think that that framework is a, a very easy way of kind of getting into it. Um, and there are a lot of different kinds of annuities that satisfy that. Uh, frankly, they don't just have to be a SPIA, although like single premium immediate annuity, although um, that is kind of like the classic tool um, for that purpose. Um, but, you know, the, there are different ways of satisfying that. But I think the way that I see it, it's look first at what the client's what are they going to want and be satisfied with? It is less about optimization, you know, from running Monte Carlos than it is about making sure that the client is comfortable, right? And, but for a financial, any financial professional, you have got to be confident in the solutions that you're using. You've got to be confident about the annuity provider, about the annuity design, that you're using something that you feel um, okay about, that it's, that there aren't components of it that you don't understand or don't trust. And so, you know, I, meeting those requirements, I, nowadays, you have a lot of different options out there. Okay, uh, thank you both. And I think this would be a, a good time to open up to some of the questions that have been coming in, Steve. We definitely will wanna talk about from the, the audience questions, the impact of interest rates, the impact of inflation. I know there was some interest in registered index linked annuities. Well, thank you, wonderful job. Um, this is hard for me to actually not talk. <laughs> um, I will tell you, we have literally hundreds of questions but, uh, between pre-submitted and going on, and they show up both in the Q&A box, and then I just realized also in the chat box. So we'll try to sort through it. The reason I put the screen up is just to say a number of the questions that came up, um, and I don't mean there's an, an advertisement, but are covered in the RICP course. So consider that. And I, I just wanted to make people who were thinking about taking RICP to be aware that what we now, now do is the web-based um, intensive research program is built right into the taking the course. So you get the advantage of all the, the, the information for the course, but you can also attend a, a web intensive review. So I just wanted to mention that. And also the other thing is um, there was different uh, references to RISA and to other questions that really show up in Wade's book. So I just wanted to mention that. And Wade, I'm going to be embarrassed. I can't remember. Is it the Retirement Income Guidebook? A retirement planning guidebook. Just, yes. Uh, that's a more popular phrase that people search for than retirement income. <laughs> uh, just Google it. You'll see it there. So, um, so we can't answer a lot of those. We had QLEX, uh, Charitable Gift Annuities. Um, annuities um, in conjunction with Medicaid, state-sponsored retirement plans, and also uh, several questions about new tax light, whether it's Secure 2.0 or this rather bizarre uh, set of regulations coming from the IRS uh, dealing with inherited um, uh, annuities, or IRAs, I should say. Um, we have information coming up from the American College. We'll, we'll deal with that. But for today, uh, the ones that are really kind of annuity based, a ton of questions, and it, you could say it any way you want to, but interest rates are rising, inflation is up. Does it make sense to buy something like an annuity in that environment, particularly obviously fixed annuities versus we can talk about RILAs and that kind of thing in a minute? I don't know, Wade, do you want to start with that? Yeah, but let's start with you both. With interest rates going up right now, should you hold off, I, I suppose, is the way to frame the question right. on considering, and, and in this context, it would have to be like an, an immediate, a SPIA or a DIA that wouldn't benefit from any sort of subsequent interest rate increase. So if I'm retired today, should I hold off on buying the SPIA because I have a belief that interest rates will soon be higher and that would translate into a higher payout rate if I wait? So there two answers to this. The first is the mortality credits answer, which is that the lower the interest rates, the greater the effect of, of mortality credits. And then, you know, interest rates come up and you're still going to have the mortality credits. And yes, you know, interest rates will be rising. Um, I, you know, it's the question is what happens if you put off the purchase of the annuity? Um, because you're not guaranteed of what is going to happen in the future. So, it, you know, there's not necessarily a, a clear right answer, but it's 
there it's not a hundred percent contingent on interest rates alone. Um, and so that that's answer number one. The answer number two is um, I have a colleague who's working on his PhD, and I've been fortunate enough or unfortunate enough to be asked to edit his uh, academic papers that are very mathy and hard to get through. But I did learn uh, some interesting stuff about some of uh, this cutting edge research. <laughs> and basically, um, in a rising rate environment, it is actually not better to delay unless rates are rising tremendously quickly. Now, I, like, I don't know right now if you call this tremendously quickly, but that it is, um, it is something to think about. And so in, with any of these purchases, I think that conviction is a component of the decision. It's not simply, you know, we don't know what's actually going to happen in the future. So I agree. I, I, time ago, I've had a felt experience of this um, since 2006 is when I began working in uh, the immediate annuity area of, a, of a, an insurance company. And, um, and I, you know, I worked at that time with Tom Hegna, who's a pretty famous in our community for, um, for a, an annuity spokesperson, if you will. And, um, and so he was heading our wholesaling group at the time and, and the, um, the agents and advisors uh, with whom he was working back in 2006 were saying that, that they were working with clients who would say, you know what, I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna buy this crazy SPIA thing. I'm gonna wait until rates come up and that's when I'm gonna buy it. That was 16 years ago. And it has not been the case that payout rates on SPIAs have yet risen to the point that they were at at that time. So if you all wanna wait <laughs> to ensure your retirements, I mean, and that, that comes back to the point of psychology relative to the finance. Um, you know, in my view, the psychology is the really material element of the retirement experience. and. And so, you know, I personally, I'm, I'm a safety first kind of person. I personally would prefer and would prefer if I did have retail clients that, that they have their basic expenses covered with a guaranteed source. I understand that means adding to it potentially if it is the case that inflation occurs at a more uh, pronounced rate than it did previously. But, um, but that's okay if you have a portfolio that um, that is designed intentionally in this way, then that'll be possible to affect. It's helpful. And one other thing we talked about um, is the idea of maybe uh, stacking or laddering annuities as well. So, you know, I don't have to buy my last QLAC this, this past year. Um, one other that I want to bring up, and it's come up in an unusual way, several of you wrote questions about how do you deal with the fact that old fashioned annuities were considered too expensive and all that, but we had a number of people also worried about the estate planning consequences of the fact that annuities, or at least uh, SPIAs, stop when your breathing stops. How do you reconcile annuity planning with, uh, uh, with estate planning? And I know that's a tough question to throw at you, but several comments and questions here. It's not that tough, it's in that paper. So, uh... <laughs> So you do actually get improvements to legacy um, with the use of the annuity um, because you're able to allocate the other assets aggressively. So I, yeah, you know what I'm saying, like in a balanced portfolio. Exactly. Um, and so it's it's a matter of using the annuity as part of the fixed income allocation, not as some like separate floating thing. Well, I, I want to make sure we get to the hot new uh, uh, topic. So, uh, Tomiko, you know where I'm going with this. Uh, can you talk about uh, what's going on with RILAs and why that may be a solution in the right market? Sure. Um, so, registered index linked annuities, um, it's the name everybody hates, but we can't find another one that people can agree on. So, um, anyway, the, this is basically a structured note on an annuity chassis. Um, and there are certain advantages and disadvantages to the different formats. I, you know, I know we're running short on time, so feel free to reach out if anybody wants to follow up on any of these topics. Um, but I think the interesting thing is that the um, buffer structure is the most popular um, because it offers a very different risk characteristic with exposure to the tail risk because the buffer protects you against the first X percentage, say 10, 15, 20% percentage loss, and then exposes you to the losses below that. Um, so this is, like I say, tail risk exposure, and what that tail risk exposure buys you is more upside. 
Um, the thing that's interesting from a risk standpoint is that the greater the downside risk, the greater that the risk, the tail will actually come to fruition, then the higher the upside. And so I think that you know, visually you see, oh, look, the cap is higher, um, but it may expose you to more risk. Yet at the same time, when, if you're repeating the strategy like year after year, if you're using a one-year term, um, you know, that also helps to actually, um, you know, mediate that risk quite a bit. So a lot of folks are really looking at this as a new asset class um, within a portfolio, as opposed to say like a full replacement. This is not, it does not replace any of the other current annuity solutions. So. That's, that's my take. Wade, do you have any others you want to ask? Yeah, the inflation, I think we did cover that to the extent that you're thinking about like a, a laddering approach as well. And, and maybe the other element of that with Tomiko's point about not negatively impacting legacy and so forth. You don't necessarily, well, just like you don't need legacy through the annuity, you don't need the inflation protection through the annuity. It's more about the role it can play in meeting expenses that are then allow other assets to become the source of the inflation protection, the source, the source of the legacy, just to clarify that. We still have some pushback on the estate planning issue. And that's how I started as an estate plan. So I, a planner, uh, I empathize, but the point that we are making is if you have a known income source coming from annuities, not, not necessarily for your whole wealth, but I mean, that being part of it, then you're in a position to use other assets to be the legacy assets used in estate planning. So there's a lot of studies on that and Wade has done some really interesting things with that. So we'll come back and re review that, but I just wanna make it clear, we're not being uh, catty and just saying, you know, who cares about uh, our heirs? It can actually make sense to use annuity strategies as part of the estate plan. So it's the top of the hour. I really want to thank, and we're getting uh, wonderful comments from, uh, from the chat. Thank you for uh, a great job, Tomiko and Michelle, and obviously Wade. So on behalf of the Retirement Income Center at the American College, really want to thank you for a great panel. Any other comments, Wade? No, other than thank you, Michelle. Thank you, Tomiko. Really enjoyed the, what you're able to bring in terms of the information and knowledge today. We appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, thank you all.